So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Eric Bichard. Uh, you can find my Twitter handle right here, HTTP Junkie. Um, so definitely, you know, check me out on Twitter. I'm a developer advocate for Kindo React. Um, Kindo is based out of Bulgaria, and um, so I do a lot of work over there, but I also uh, live here in the Bay Area. <clears throat> and uh, just a quick show of hands, because I've never, I've never talked at Silicon Valley Code Camp before, so I don't necessarily know, uh, you know, the, the attendance and who knows React and JavaScript. So just a raise of hands, who regularly writes JavaScript in here? Good, perfect. And then uh, what about Angular or React? What about just React? You. Perfect. Okay. And then I'm hoping that at least some of you that are new to React maybe caught Eve's talk earlier because it should lay the kind of foundation for what React is and how to use it. Um, one of the things that I can tell you, and I'm, I'm just going to start off with some, some basic stuff here and just tell you about myself because I, I think we still have some people filing in. Um, I worked at SolarCity and Tesla as a component developer, mostly working in Angular. Um, until last year, they had a bunch of layoffs, like 4,000 people. Uh, and uh, so I, I, had to, I had to leave Tesla, and I was uh, starting to look for jobs in the Bay Area. And I, I just realized that if I didn't know React, or if I didn't at least know another framework, it was going to be very hard for me to find another job. And I'd already started kind of messing with React a little bit by, by studying Redux. So Redux is not part of React, but... It's been around, uh, it was originally kind of written for uh, React, but it is, it is uh, framework agnostic. But it's a way of managing state. So when I started to learn about Redux, I also learned that React has a very prescribed way for dealing with state in their application. And if any of you worked in C Sharp or Java or even some of the other uh, JavaScript libraries, uh, uh, frameworks like Angular, you might have noticed that there's not a an actual prescribed way of doing state management. Um, so React has like a one-way data flow, and what, what that means is that someone like me who's a component developer who doesn't have a CS degree and has no business rolling their own state management uh, solution, it gives us a way of very easily getting into the library and being able to uh, have a way to affect state, and for free we get all of our components updated uh, you know, by that, by, by that model. So that's kind of the reasons that I got into React. I've been doing React now for about a year and a half. And since uh, before that, uh, I was doing Angular for a few years, but I've been developing since 99, 2000. So I know I don't look that old, but uh, I am. <laughs> Again, uh, I'm the developer advocate for Kindo React, so uh, when I'm not talking about React and kind of uh, giving talks and going to different conferences. One of the things I'm doing is I'm working with the uh, engineering team at Kindo React to build uh, UI components for the uh, React ecosystem. So you can check that out whether you want to, or if you want to. Um, I also have a, I'm gonna show this now and at the end of the talk. And this, will, this is a link to all of the resources. The company I work for is Progress. The O is left out on purpose. I was finding a short URL and this is the one that worked. Um, I also gave the same talk at React Live in Amsterdam about t uh, three weeks ago, a month ago. And the one thing I would say is if you like this talk and you want to see a kind of a condensed 30-minute uh, version of it, you can go on YouTube and uh, I think it's Front End Developer Love is the name of the YouTube channel or Front End, Front End Love. And they do a bunch of different conferences, but React Live is one of them. And literally, if you go to their video section, I'm the last person that was uploaded, so it's right there. But um, also, all the things that I talk about in this talk, uh, the demo, uh, the GitHub repository, all that stuff is at this uh, URL right here. So you should be able to find that with no problems. So the way I usually like to start this talk is um, I already kind of gave you a little bit of background about myself and how I got into React. And the way that I usually am, and I'm probably sure a lot of you are the same way, when, when you get into something, whether it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a new international traveler, so I learn everything about planes, right? But when I got into React, I also kind of learned everything about the history of React. And what I wanted to do was kind of go over a timeline of, uh, uh, 
of React and kind of show you that since the beginning of React, they've always kind of had a solution for state management and for setting state and being able to work with state inside of your application and inside of your components and having that one-way data flow. So back in 2013, React was released uh, originally and set state was a part of React from the very beginning. So from the beginning, you had the ability to go and create a component and if you had something that you needed to track for state for that component, you could easily set your state, say, let's say it was a to-dos list, right? Or, or maybe just a Boolean value. And uh, so you use set state and then you can affect that state at any time and tell it what the new value is gonna be. What's the new value of the state gonna be? And then that value gets propagated down to, uh, through props to all of your components. What that means is that whenever I, I change state in my application, that's the only thing I need to worry about is changing that state and my components automatically update. So I thought this was amazing. I, I was doing this in Angular, but it wasn't as easy as this, right? If you've worked with Angular before, RxJS, uh, observables, uh, subscribers, listeners, all that kind of stuff, you kind of had to set up that of yourself. Um, I know it's getting a little bit easier nowadays with Angular, but um, I just feel like React's always had this kind of way of doing this. In 2014, Flux was previewed at F8, and um, let's see here. Uh, so basically, Facebook had a big issue with using MVC, and as you can see, uh, state is very hard to track in an MVC application with your models and views and everything. Uh, so short story, they came up with Flux and this kind of uh, action dispatcher uh, store workflow, this one-way data flow. And the reason was is because they had an issue at the beginning where when you would go into Facebook and you had your messages from your friends, um, it would show a little red circle in the, uh, right above your messages, I think it was red, and it would say like five, right? So that would mean I have five messages that I haven't read yet. But people would click on it, and they didn't have any new messages. What was happening was the state was getting mixed up um, because of that, right? So um, almost immediately, React has set state. They also bring in this idea of flux. This is like kind of a pattern for managing state. And then um, in 2015, Dan Abramov uh, at, I believe it was, React Europe, yep, uh, he introduced Redux, which was using kind of the pattern of flux, but with reducers kind of combined. So we all know what a reducer is, and I'll talk a little bit more about reducers in a few minutes for those who don't. But um, I'm not gonna say that Redux is like the best thing for managing state. You, and one of the things that I'm gonna show you in this talk is why you don't need it uh, at all, um, especially when you're starting out. Now, as things get more complex and your application scales, there might be a use for it. Um, further down the timeline, React uh, Fiber came out in 2017. And React Fiber was a, like a complete rewrite of the core reconciliation algorithm inside of uh, React. So it improved performance of rendering DOM changes to the screen and uh, paving the way for new developer experiences like the Context API. Uh, well, they had, they had the Context API. Did it, has anyone used like the old, old, old Context API, which was, they would, yeah, well, there was a prepended uh, thing before it that said like, do not use, this is trash, or whatever it is. Like, uh, but still people used it. My guys at Kindle React, they used it, and then a year ago, they're ripping it out and putting the new stuff in. Well, then came Context API, which was the like official version of it. Now the problem with Context API is that it used a pattern called render props. It's not really a problem, but uh, where, where this would kind of come into, uh, become a problem is that you would have to nest providers and then inside, so you'd put a tag around maybe your entire application that was like app provider. And you'll actually see me do something like that in our demo. But then anywhere you wanted to use that data, you had to wrap these con consumer tags around it. Uh, I think that was right, consumer or consumer, yeah. So, um, that created kind of, kind of like a nesting hell problem again. Um, so with React Fiber, with all the pain points that they experienced with Context API from the beginning, so uh, Sebastian, who works on the React team, I heard this cool story from Dan Abramov actually on my way in here today, and I thought I'd tell it, because I have extra time today. I've got like an hour to do this talk. Um, so what happened is they had that original don't use this Context API, this is just experimental. 
And they're like, well, we got to fix this. We got to make it to where people can use it and it has a, it has a decent API. Well, they did that and they kind of just made things worse. They didn't really make it any better. Some would say they made it worse. But the point is, is that when they, they, had, they had an issue that they needed to try and solve and they had a pain point, which was that new context API and this, ne this nesting hell and these render props that forced them to come up with a new way of creating an API for the context API. And some may not know this, but Hooks was actually born out of, out of that, right? Out of uh, experiencing that pain point and kind of just pressing it and kind of massaging it out and, and eventually coming up with something better that worked for context API. And by the way, you don't have to use those consumer tags wrapped around all your data anymore. You can just say use context at the top of your uh, document and you can save it off to a variable and then use that context variable anywhere and either access state or effect state off of that context variable. So that was, uh, that was awesome. Um, and then 2019, actually 2018, end of 2018, this time last year was about when uh, Hooks came out as a beta and, or alpha, one of them, I don't know, um, something like that. And so I started using it about then, but then in 2019 they had an actual stable uh, release. A little bit late, but um, released nonetheless. Um, some of the, the points that I was showing you on that timeline, so this, this here is a video from Dan Abramov, and I wanna go back for a second here. Um, this first video, is an introduction to React. If you want to get a good history on React, I have resources available uh, in the links of this talk that have this video, which, by the way, is like at 480p, and it's, it's kind of horrible to watch, but it's interesting to kind of see how things haven't changed that much since they came up with uh, React. Also, this talk here about how they developed Flux. Um, another talk, which was Dan Abramov's uh, hot reloading with time traveling, uh, kind of integrating Redux into your application. And um, we also had a video from Lynn Clark who talks about uh, what React Fiber was. Like I said, it was a rebuild of their uh, reconciliation algorithm and how that kind of paved the way for new developer experiences. And um, so if, if you were to go through and kind of watch all those videos in succession, you would really have a, real, a good idea of where React's come from and where it is now. And so. Um, if you're like me and you like digging into things, uh, that would be an interesting kind of way to uh, start navigating React if you're not familiar with it. So again, 16.8 uh, is the uh, release that we had that, that, uh, where, where hooks became a thing. And just to really uh, try to break it down what hooks are, because really hooks are just a function. The, the, it's nothing more, nothing less. There are some rules around how you use it, which we'll talk about later, but at the very Simplest bit, let's say that you have a component that does a bunch of data fetching and then you're saving that data off into a variable, right? That whole little section there, you can just put into a function, put it in another file, and then hook into it, right? Uh, so basically extracting it. So, um, and hooks, uh, we needed hooks because of a, a reason, because before we had hooks, you could use functional components inside of React, but in order to really work with state and a couple other things, you really needed to have class components. So uh, hooks gave you the, the ability to start to consume state as well as all these other things that hooks provide, whether it's uh, hooks that they're giving you right out of the box or custom ones that you're making inside of a functional component. And if you've ever written React components before, uh, I would uh, hope that you agree that hooks and, and, and functional components specifically, are way easier than writing class components. Um, that was one of the reasons I got away from Angular is because I thought I, would, you know, I, I didn't like writing in TypeScript a lot. I liked the idea of creating a very simple application, not having to get into types and, and being able to write more functionally. And so React kind of brought us back to that with uh, functional components and the ability to use hooks and state within those functional components. So hooks provide to React a very simple uh, primitive that's better than a class component, right? They also provide kind of contained composable behaviors. So what does that all mean for you, the developer? Um, that means from inside of a functional component, you can add state, you can add a regular, 
uh, hook, like we said from, from React, that they have some built-in ones, use state, use context, use reducer, use ref. Um, or you can use custom hooks that you've built yourself from within a functional component. You can also share non-visual logic and, and have a lot better code reuse with hooks. Uh, it's not that you couldn't do that before, but it makes it easier to tap into them now. Um, you can remove distributed logic by co-locating code. Um, we'll show examples of that with use effect. And, it started, and, and we're starting to see the replacement of a higher order components and uh, kind of getting away from this wrapper hell that we used to have. Think, think about back jQuery back in the day and how we'd have all these uh, callbacks and everything and how that turned into this pyramid of doom, uh, callback hell. And uh, same thing can kind of happen with HOCs or anything that gets nested, really. The, anything that's ubiquitous that gets nested always ends up with this pyramid of doom. So uh, hooks kind of flattens everything out for you. It makes it easier to kind of understand how your code is written. Uh, it gets to us to our last point, clean and concise syntax. And I'm going to show you guys over the next few slides here in a minute just how clean and concise it can be. And then you can use your imagine to, uh, imagination to scale that out. Uh, I was talking about a few rules for hooks. So again, hook is just a function, but you never call it from within a loop. You never call it from within a nested function. Uh, they always sit at the top level of your component. So visually, that's uh, from where you create your uh, component to the return statement in that area there, right? That's where you want to uh, create these hooks. And you can only call them from within a functional component or another custom hook. Now, there's, there is someone who wrote a, a silly library that allows you to do it in classes, but that's just, that's just dumb. Um, actually, it's probably not dumb. Like, maybe you have like that one class that was just so hard to rewrite as a hook because it was monolithic and the guy who wrote it's not around anymore, and maybe it's just easy to consume some state through this, uh, this new plugin with that you can use, not this run here, but um, yeah. So you can consume uh, hooks from a class component. Uh, it's just like, why? Um, when you get started with hooks, you probably want to get some ESLint rules set up. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to install this plugin right here, which is ESLint plugin React hooks. And what this will do is this will get you to where you can run npm uh, lint, npm run lint, and uh, if there, if you've used like a uh, a use effect inside of a conditional, or if you didn't set it up at the top level of your component, then you're going to get warnings uh, in that, in, in either in your build if you set it up that way, or if you just run your linter. So the easiest way to start using hooks is with use state. This is um, pretty much the first thing that you play around with when you, when you learn hooks. <clears throat> Everyone see that okay? I can't make this any bigger. When I get to my actual demos, I can make the, the, slide, the code bigger, but on these slides, I can't. So sorry about that. Um, so this is a class component in React, right? And I'll give you a second to look at it. But basically, we're doing something very simple here. Down in our return statement, we have a button. And every time you click on it, we want to increase the amount of uh, the, the account, and we want to display it in the p tag just above it. So to do this, in a class component, you would have a constructor. Um, typically, you'd have to call super. You need to do a bind your increment count method that actually set the state up in your constructor. It just all makes for a lot of extra code. It also makes it for someone who has never experienced React before to walk in and go, what the heck is this, right? Why do I need that? Why is something not working? Oh, because you didn't bind it in your constructor. Um, so in functional components and hooks, you get away from that. You don't have to use that stuff. But this is how, this is what it looked like just to do one thing, to affect one piece of state and one component with one button. So in a, in a functional component with hooks, this is what you got, right? So at the beginning here, the first line, it says const count set count equals use state zero. So what's going on here? What's going on is that zero is the default. That's where count's going to start from. Um, we're destructuring. So what use state re returns to the user is count and set count. Count is the actual variable that you will use down here uh, in, in your code to represent that value. And then to affect that value, to change it, you're going to use set count. So use state 
which is a hook, a, a built-in hook for React. It gives you the ability to not only track uh, a piece of state, but also to modify it using that second uh, set count there. And typically the way, so you actually can call set count right from like a button on click or something. You typically don't want to do that. Um, there's many reasons why you don't want to do it. I'm not going to get into all of them. But um, I, one of the reasons is I like to, when I'm writing code, I'll set up variables sometimes when I'm writing code for the first time that are outside of like these, uh, like that, that con the increment count, right? That goes into a, a function, anonymous function right away, and there's no really way to debug that. Not easily, anyway. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to get, put the curly braces around it, put a return inside, put a variable right above that so that you can kind of debug that. So I like kind of separating things out at the beginning, and then as I get closer to shipping something, I'll consolidate things down and do it the easy way. A little bit bigger. See, I, I lied. I can make it bigger. Uh, hooks allowed us to make the screen bigger. <laughs> I don't know why that's always... I, I said that on accident one day, and everyone laughs at it, so I keep saying it. Anyways. Boy, that's, that's blinding. Um, <laughs> so another thing that you want to do with hooks, besides setting state, is that you want to be able to affect something outside of your application, right? Outside of your component, outside the barrier of your application. So one of the, um, back to our hooks example here of our counter, one thing that you might want to do is set the document title. Right? This is the most canonical thing that we can use to explain a use effect hook because it's, it's the first thing outside of your application that you can affect very easily. Right? You call document.title and you can set whatever you know, the title inside the tab of your browser. But that's not part of React, right? That's something outside of React. Just like local storage is outside of React, just like uh, IndexedDB is outside of React, just like your database, your API, and all that stuff is outside of React. So if you want to fetch data, if you want to change document title, if you want to set local storage, we're going to do that inside of a use effect. Um, and I've already explained everything else here, so the next thing we should do is kind of look back at how we did this with classes, right? <laughs> so we used to have a component did mount and a component did update. And the problem with those is that we would have to duplicate code inside of them. Now, sure, I can stick this out into its own little function and call that function from within inside of each of these, but my point here was to kind of dramatically show that we were duplicating code throughout these two different lifecycle hooks in order to achieve something like updating something outside of the application. And this, when you get into more complex examples, can get very frustrating, especially for people that are new. Why not just do it all inside the use effect? Another thing about use effect is that you can put as many of these on the page as you want. You can have one that updates the document title. Then you could copy that whole little use effect there down, and then you could uh, update your local storage, right? So, so what it allow, another thing it allows you to do is co-locate code in your, uh, or logic into separate use effects, whereas in this situation here, I would have to put uh, multiple things inside the did mount and multiple things inside the... Uh, did update that were not related to each other at all. So this allows you to do that. The old way doesn't. Plus, I don't know, this just seems easier to read to me. Of course, you need to know a little bit about what these things do, but uh, outside of understanding how a hook works and how it returns and what destructuring is, like this is very simple to read. This exp ex expanded out and kind of um, scaled out uh, becomes a horrible thing to have to deal with. A little bit larger, just in case you want to take a look at it one more time. So we're using two different hooks here, right? Use state and use effect. And this is a functional component. Why? Because it's not a class. So a few tricks to using use effect. We can pass a second argument to use effect. And what this allows us to do, well, let's focus really quick on not passing that second argument. So if you just use the use effect like we saw in the earlier screen, that document title example, um, you would, you, your use effect would run when the component is first rendered and also on every subsequent re-render, right? Um, that's great for that document.title, but if we're fetching data, we don't want that to happen. 
So we'd use the second one here where we pass an empty dependency array to it, right? So this empty uh, array here says, we have dependencies. What are they? None. <laughs> it's, just a, it's, just a, it's just a little hack on making sure that that thing only renders once when we first run the component and never again in the subsequent re-renders. Now on the third one here, we actually have some variables inside the uh, dependency array. And I'm going to assume right now, because this is no, there's no other context here, but that these are props. In other words, inputs into your component, right? So let's say that I had a, a, um, a whatever component, and instead of doing props inside the parens, uh, I did, I destructured and, and did ID and name, right? So I have ID and name being passed in from some other page, and I'm saying that I only want this use effect to run when ID or name value changes, right? So it's gonna, it's gonna run on the, this effect will run on the first render of my component, but never again unless one of those props change. There's more complex ways that you can do this, but for just getting a, a, a grasp on hooks and understanding functional components and how they work, this is pretty much all you need to know out of the gate. No, no second argument, blank dependency array, or shove some stuff in the dependency array. Um, another thing that you might want to do is clean up after a hook, right? So let's say that you are um, dealing with uh, something outside of your application that is uh, doing a subscribe, like uh, for a user or something, I don't know. Uh, and you want to be able to unsubscribe after the component is kind of removed from the DOM. So very, it's very simple. Inside of your use effect, you will return a function. Inside that function is your cleanup, right? No special API or anything. These are all little tricks that you have to know, but I like it better this way because it's not much to remember and, um, and it works very effectively and, it's, and again, it's easy to remember. Uh, so here in this use effect, it will only run, it will only subscribe on the first time or any time that the uh, username is actually uh, updated. Aside from that, it will unsubscribe when this uh, component is unloaded from the DOM. Cleaning up. So my favorite hook of all is an alternative to use state. It's called use reducer. And that's actually what our demo, actually my demo is gonna have a lot of stuff in it and we've got a lot of time so it, uh, it'll be very uh, nice to kind of go through an entire application and see how everything's set up and see how I'm using hooks in many different ways. But let's talk about um, use reducer first. <clears throat> so, what is a reducer in plain JS? How many people uh, kind of know what a reducer is in JS? Like, okay. You, you can kind of raise your hand even if you kind of know, all right, cool. All right. So it's a method that executes a provided reducer function on each element of array, an array and returns a single output. So let's see an example of that. Let's say that we have a bunch of different uh, districts that have all voted and we want to uh, just know how many people voted in all the districts. Well, we could write a reducer that takes that votes by district and just kind of runs through them all and we have an accumulator and a current value and we're, and we're constantly returning either the accumulator plus the, the current value. So uh, 250 plus 510 plus 330 plus 410. So if we run the reducer using this reducer right here, I know a lot of, a lot of reduce uh, terminology in here, but if we run, run reduce using that reducer, we're gonna get 1500. Another thing that you can do with a reducer is you can pass a second argument in here, right? Second argument is what? It's default, right? So it's, or starting point. Initializer, thank you. That's actually a better word for it. <laughs> so if we were to do the, this last one here and start with 100, then obviously we would end up at 1600 at the end. So that's kind of how a reducer works. At its very simplest, you know, a, a, this, a sum reducer is like the simplest reducer that you can have. So let's see a, a little bit different way of using a reducer. So in this example here, I have an array of objects. And these objects are to-do items, right? Um, and each of them has a priority level. And what we want is we want a reducer that's gonna take in 
all of these objects and return the one object that has the highest priority. So as you can see here, we have um, highest and to-do, uh, accumulator and current. So when we run through them, each one of them is a to-do. It returns is the highest priority more than the to-do dot priority. So the first time it would be two. The second time it would be three that would replace the highest one. Third time would be one. It would not replace the highest one. So at the end, we would say laundry was the highest priority. And, and in my house, that is the highest priority, laundry. Dishes is last. Although it says second here, but yeah. Uh, use reducer is an alternative to use state. So when we're talking about use reducer, the hook in React, this is uh, something that you can use instead of use state. So we saw a nice example of use state earlier. Uh, and that's good for like, let's say we have a Boolean value that we just need to change from true to false back and forth or a string that just needs to change. That's great to use use state for. But what if you have a list of to-dos where you need to add a to-do, remove a to-do, update to-dos, uh, check a to-do complete. For this, you're gonna have different sub-values that you need to be able to uh, affect the, the state. So you would use use reducer. And what use reducer does is you pass it a reducer and initial state. Um, and the reducer will have all the case statements in it like, you know, add a to-do, remove a to-do, uh, check when complete. And what a, redu a use reducer returns is kind of just like use state, we have a variable that represents the actual state, to-dos. But we also have just dispatch. You can actually name dispatch whatever you want, but it's best to just always call it dispatch. Um, and so let's see an actual, well, before we see an example of the code, this is kind of the basic flow. You have a button. Uh, it, it calls a function that dispatches an action. That gets handled by a reducer, which uh, involves a new state being returned. That new state is then available for you to use. So using a reducer might look like this for our to-dos, right? So um, we have to-dos is the variable that we want to be able to track, and, and any time that it changes, update our, our component. Dispatch um, is what we will call to send the action and everything over to the reducer. And then to-do reducer will be the actual name of the reducer that we're using. Initial state will be anything we want to start off with. So if we want, if we want to start with a, a list of kind of to-dos right out of the gate, like we have two, like, you know, we, we know every day there's trash and dishes, right? So maybe we start with those two, whatever, something like that. Very contrived example, but. Um, yeah, just again, I just kind of updated this to where, you know, when you hit the reducer, that's actually using our to-do reducer. When the new state gets returned, it's available inside that to-do's uh, variable, and you can use it. So, oops, what we're going to do now is we're going to get into a demo. And we're going to show you how some of this stuff works with use reducer. First off, does anyone have any questions yet? Uh, anything that I have explained that doesn't make sense? Anything about use state or use reducer that you don't quite get? You can use use reducer instead of use state. Yeah. I'm going to show you an actual example of both of them kind of working together on the same page. So, well, we, sh we showed an example. I, yeah, I can do that. Um, we showed an example of use state. Um, let me do find in all files here. Well, I'll show you um, use state first. So again, uh, the one I want to use when, I'm, when explaining use state is the counter example because it's so simple, right? Um, our counter wants to start off at zero, and every time we want to affect it, whether it's add one or add 20 or add 10, whatever, we just call set count and then pass into that set count what the new value is. So we could pass two here, which then it would always be two every time we update it, but we do count plus one. That way if you hit it, it'll constantly increment, right? So behind the scenes, um, uh, React is actually using use reducer behind the scenes to make use state work. That's why we really need to take a look at use reducer to understand that uh, and how it works. So um, I'm gonna just walk through basically um, completing the rest of this page. But first off, I want to show you kind of what we have here. 
Let me go to the application first and just uh, show you what we're dealing with. So I have a home page. So this is a nice little whole application that's going to be available for you guys to look at later. And it has, um, it has all sorts of stuff in here. On the home page, it has the clicker. So you can see how it's incrementing here, right here. And uh, maybe I can make this a little bit bigger. So as we click it, we're updating that value. You guys already know how that works. But also notice up here, the title is also being incremented, right? So we're using both a use state and a use effect on this page here. We also have this uh, to-dos page, which doesn't work right now. But what we want it to be able to do is you want, we want to be able to add a new to-do. We want to be able to complete a to-do, remove a to-do, and remove all to-dos, right? A few other things that this application have that, that's all using hooks is I have a little bit of a responsiveness in here in the, in the navigation going on. We've got a side nav that opens up. Those are, those are uh, basically two different Boolean values that we're tracking at a, at a global level that are using uh, state. And then our components are just uh, actually, in, in some cases, our components are reacting to it. In other cases, we are setting a class on a main div, and then the, all the CSS inside of that is either hiding or showing that nav based on what that value is. So it's, there's some pretty cool uh, ways of using that. Also, I have a light and a dark theme here that kind of toggle back and forth. And again, same concept. We're just changing a string from light to dark. And, uh, and, and then responding to that, and, 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 uh, and actually, I'll show you real quick here. If you look at the, this, this guy right here, this app container, medium and light, right? So if we move, this to small, oh, you see it changed to small, and then to medium. You can, if you can't see it, uh, just to, I can assure you that that's what's happening. And then also down here, dark, light, right? So all I'm doing is changing a class, and then I'm doing some funky stuff with CSS to kind of do one thing or another, change the theme, uh, open up or close a side nav. So there's a lot of other cool things that you can do with hooks inside of your application. But let's get to uh, building this reducer page, or, or this page, the uh, to-dos page is going to have the reducer. So um, we can see our buttons here. And, and let's just assume that we, we, we got this code from someone who kind of already prototyped this demo for us. And they don't know much about hooks, but they, they know how to set up the HTML. And they know that we're going to need a button that's going to call a delete to-do and a clear to-do and, um, and toggle complete. Also, when we type into the input and we hit either enter or we press the button, it's going to add a to-do. So what we've got up here is we've got this add to-do function, toggle complete function, delete to-do, and clear to-do. Now what each of these functions is going to do is it's going to dispatch your actions uh, to the reducer so that they can process the state change. So the first thing we need to do inside here, and I'm not going to, you're not going to have to watch me type. I've got nice little snippets in here. So the first thing we do is we set up that use reducer. Now, again, remember, kind of similar to the use state here, except we're using, instead of having an actual set to do's, we have a dispatch method. We'll get to that in a minute. We also are taking this initial state from a list of uh, to do's. So, so we're going to initially start out with three to do's, always on that page. If we were to um, set this to, uh, do that, I think, then we would have none, right? But let's not do that. Um, also, before I, just to make the page work, I had came down here and actually uh, my data for my grid is using initial state. By the way, it's a Kindle React grid. If you ever want to look into that, it's pretty cool. Um, next, we are using use state to keep track of the input typed into the little text input. So every time someone uh, does a keystroke, A, B, C, D, it is calling set text input and uh, updating that state. So next we need to, now that we actually have a to-dos object here that we can, uh, or piece of state, we can go down there and replace that. Right, so now that's going to work off the to-dos instead of that initial state. And then, um, oh yeah, we need the, we need something to keep track of how many to-dos have been checked complete? So, yeah, so here we got a filter. So basically, as uh, another thing cool about uh, hooks in, in kind of the state is that 
any time that that to-dos changes, if we have something like this set up, completed to-dos equals to-dos.filter, right? We can check how many of them are complete, and that will constantly, this completed to-dos will constantly update as our to-dos get updated, right? So what we'll have is we'll have this variable called completed to-dos, which always has the amount of the to-dos that have been checked complete. And what we're gonna do is we're going to use that to update the title using use effect, right? So, good, we've got most of this worked out. Uh, one other thing we need to do is down here, we need to add the update text input function. So this is going to be what runs every time that you type a character into the input here. And uh, yeah, so we need one more here. So, is. so now, when the input changes on change, we're going to call update text input value. It's going to uh, know the character that was text uh, passed in, and, and we're actually gonna get that into value from calling event.target.value. And then we're going to simply call set text input. Boom, and we've got, so we've got a variable now that always ha is always up to date with whatever we've typed. And whenever we click add to do, so once we type it into the input, and we hit enter, or we hit the update button, it's going to actually add that to do so now we need to be able to call that dispatch method here. So that's, this is the most uh, complicated dispatch that we will use in this example. And it's not that hard to understand here. We're dispatching an object to our reducer. It's of a type called to do, add to do. The name of this to do is gonna be whatever was in, whatever's in text input at the time. Uh, it also, the completed is gonna be false because we never wanted to do when we first create it to be checked true. Afterwards, we set input back to nothing, right? Because we want them to be able to enter a new to-do. Now, we need to then go into our reducer, and we need to add. So when we're in our reducer, what we're actually returning for each of these cases is what's the new state gonna look like, right? Oops, wrong one. All right. So what we're doing is we're, we're returning a ternary statement here, but what it basically says is, hey, did the name actually have a length? Did they, did they type something in? Okay, if so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the existing three to-dos that already exist, we're gonna spread those out right here. And then we're gonna append a new to-do onto the end of that, for the ID, we're gonna just take the current number of to-dos and add one to it. Yeah, this may not be production code, but it'll work for a demo. Um, the name will just be action.name, whatever we passed in for name, and same with complete, right? We passed in false for each of them uh, the first time. So what this will do, um, with this in, in, in place here, we should actually see that when we add one here, let's see, take dog for walk. Cool, so now it adds a to-do to our list, our component, our grid automatically updates, because why? Because we changed state, right? We added a piece of state to to-dos. Um, next, we want to go and do our toggle complete. These next ones, I'm gonna do them all at one time here because they're super easy. So we've got dispatch, toggle complete, and we pass an ID. That's all we need for that one. Uh, because when we're toggling something complete, all we need to know is what ID was the uh, to do that we're trying to toggle complete. Then, for delete to do, same thing. We just need to know which one to delete. Again, just passing an ID. The last one's gonna be the easiest one because all we have to do is say clear to do's. Uh, all we're gonna be doing there is really just resetting it to a empty array. So now, let's go create the, uh, the reducer return statement for each of these cases. So, on a toggle complete, very simple, we're going to say, what's the current state? Let's map those out. And anywhere that the ID that was passed in actually matches the item ID that I'm, I'm mapping over, we're gonna return that one only with the complete value flipped. All other ones we're just gonna return as they are. So at the end, we get all of the same uh, to-dos returned back, but the one that we wanted to affect has a flipped complete value. It's the opposite. Instead of true, it's now, or instead of false, it's now true. To delete, very, uh, very similar for the delete. 
oops, oh, eight. Well, we're just going to filter that state out. So we're going to say state filter, and we're going to remove the ID uh, or, or the to do with the ID that matches. And then on the last one here, simply just return an empty array. So now we've got all of this stuff working here. Let me just make sure we've got everything. Yeah. All right. So now we should be able to take out cat. We should be able to check complete. Notice that when we check complete, our use effect is also running in uh, tandem with it and setting the, um, the document title to one, two, three. As we remove one of them, it will go back to two. Remove another one, back to one. Check another one, it's back up to two, right? So all of this stuff is working with each other. And this is the power of hooks and functional components and all this stuff being used together is that um, we've, we've really quickly just been able to go through here, set up some state, set up a use effect, and um, call a few functions that uh, affect that state, and our component just responds to all the changes. So if you're new to React, if you're new to hooks, this is kind of what makes it so awesome. Um, for those who've kind of been uh, using React and hooks for a while, let's explore a little bit about how this app is working uh, with some of the other things going on, right? Remember I told you that we have this navigation up here that when I, when I cross this threshold, I go from medium to small, and then I'm reacting to that, and I'm hiding the nav and showing the hamburger icon. So really quick to go see how that works. And as a kind of like, a, let's just walk through the app real quick. At the app level, we have an app provider, right? That's providing context to the rest of the app. That means anything that we load in this frame component here, which is basically my entire application, uh, kind of router and everything. Uh, we've got semantic uh, HTML in here to make it really easy to understand what parts are what. And uh, any component that's loaded in here inside this router, so basically when you click on home or to-dos, it is um, loading one of these routes based on it matching a route or not. So uh, it'll load to-dos, and to-dos will automatically have access to context. Why? Because it's inside this, which is inside of the provider. And in, uh, in, in order to use that state, that context, um, I'm going to show you a a place where we're using it real quick, and then I'm going to go show you how we create the context. So we, all we do is we import app context, and we call context equals use context, use app context, right? Now, anywhere in this document, I can refer to that context, and I can call either a method on it, or I can grab some state inside of there and pull it out, right? Um, I know if you work in Java or C Sharp, there are similar things to this with providers and, and everything. So it's not, it's not a new concept to React, but it's, uh, it's similar to those things as well. Here is actually how that uh, context is set up. So this context, I'm calling it the app context. Why? Because it's global to my app. Um, the first thing I'm doing, uh, let's, let's look at this part right here. So I have a couple of values that are just state. Nav open starts as false. Right? When, I'm on, when my application loads, I do not want my navigation to be open. Theme mode, which is either light or dark, is actually going to do, we're actually uh, using another custom hook here, which is watching a media query. What this media query right here does is it goes out and checks whether I have light or dark theme uh, enabled on my computer or my Android or my Mac, whatever it is. And, it's, and I'm going to say, hey, do they have dark set? If so, I'm going to default to the dark theme. Otherwise, I'm going to default to the light theme. Second, when I go to actually set theme mode, I'm going to say first, let's check local storage and make sure that they, we haven't saved off a, th a theme mode preference there. Otherwise, let's then default, defer to uh, preferred theme and check if they have it on their computer, otherwise light. So uh, what that would enable me to do is if I change my, if I had the application open right now, and I changed mine to dark, and then I refreshed the page, my theme would go dark because it was able to read that value. So that's something cool like with, with hooks is that you can easily kind of go out and just watch a media query, and then that's going to be a Boolean value right here, and then what I'm doing is I'm either saying dark or light, 
is, this, is, is the preferred theme. And I can use that preferred theme anywhere in my application, and I'm actually, uh, actually the way I use it in my application is through this variable here called theme mode. Um, we also have this screen announcement, which I'll get into later, but we're not gonna get into right now. So um, this is our context uh, that we are subscribing to throughout our application. Um, so let's go back into the app.js or the frame.js, and I'll show you how we are, because uh, we were talking about how are we setting that min, that, that, that uh, medium or small breakpoint, how, how are we setting that and kind of making sure that the app updates to it? Well, again, we're just using the same custom hook that we used earlier, use media predica predicate, which you can watch any media query. How many media queries are out there? Too many for me to name right now. But you can watch each one of them and, and, and save it off to a JavaScript variable. Try doing that in CSS, you can't do it, right? You have to set it, even if you have a vanilla JS application, this is something that's not super easy to do. So um, that's, that's super powerful that at any place in my application I can watch a media query and I can, I can set a, a variable and then use that throughout my JavaScript code in, a, in the one-way data flow where it's, it's being tracked by state and anything that uses that gets updated when it updates. That's why whenever I change from medium to small, I change that class and everything reacts according to, right? I know that's not the reason why they called React React, but it's kind of like, it's funny that everything is just reacting to state. Um, we still have about 10 minutes, um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, we, yep, mm-hmm. Yeah, this frame right here, this is the frame. What's the question? The, the SCSS file. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The app.scss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing here. It's pretty cool. Uh, so who uses SAS? Awesome. So you know that you can nest things inside of a SAS selector, correct? So if we, if, uh, my components on my page, they're Kindo React. And this is not, I swear this is not like a, a, like a commercial for Kindo React. But I have the ability uh, on my company's website to go download a dark and a light theme. So all that I did is I created, and this may be a good way of doing it or not, um, depends on how much SAS is inside those <laughs> imports. But I set up an app container.light and an app container.dark, and that's the one you were seeing earlier uh, that was switching whenever I hit the theme button, and then I'm just importing uh, either the light theme here or the dark theme down here. What that does is that front loads all of my uh, styles for light and dark at the beginning of the application running so that when I hit that switch, there is nothing that needs to be loaded. It's all there and ready to go and it just switches and acts accordingly. All this stuff, again, reacting from uh, using use state and hooks and all these things, just kind of the, the application reacting to it. Um, well, you would have to be, you would have to change things out, out quite a bit. And uh, I think style components is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but uh, there's nothing wrong with style components. You would just have to kind of do it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did want to get to before we, we get too far, <coughs> is, and I'm sorry about that. Um, one of the things about this application that I really want to stress on um, is that the, the components that I use here are pretty accessible, but this page is not accessible at all. And I don't know if you guys want me to run the screen reader or not, but let me just tell you what would happen here. If you ran a screen reader on this page right now, what would happen is that as you got into the grid, you, uh, once you tabbed over the complete and the remove button, it would just go, button. And you'd be like, what the hell? Like, if you're blind and you can't see that it says complete or remove above it, then that sucks. Uh, also, when you enter a new task, you know, take something out, right? When you add it, nothing is gonna happen on the screen reader. It's not gonna say, oh, just add it. we just added to do, take something out, right? Or when you click on it and complete one, it's not gonna say, take something out, completed, take something out, deleted, all to, all to do's, removed. So one thing that I would stress uh, is it's, even if we, when we use these components, 
like the ones I'm using that are really good with accessibility, those are just little islands of accessibility throughout our application. And what I wanted to show you was a way that I took hooks and kind of solved that problem and, and, and bridged the rest of that gap and, and kind of got my, my page up to about 90% accessibility. So if we go and look at this uh, alternate page of to-dos, right, um, we have this context.set screen reader announcement. And that's just, a, it's just a, something that I created on my own. And, and if, if we look back over here into the, the, this global context, we've got a screen reader announcement that's null at the beginning. And at any time, I can pass a message to it, and the screen reader will read it out. So with that, along with also in conjunction with using, um, let me see here. Oops, wrong one, to-dos. In conjunction with using ARIA labels here, between those two, which I would say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight lines of code there, 9, 10, 11, 12, less than 15 lines of code, I've changed my application, because it was so easy with hooks to do this right here, to going from being like 60% accessible to 90% accessible. And one of the things that I would say, um, and that's kind of where I'm going to end this, and you can take all of these, uh, you can take this whole application down and kind of play with it and, uh, and see how it works. Um, but accessibility, um, I just want to say a little bit about this because we, it's on the onus of us, us as developers to not just leave a page where it's half-ass accessibility, right? Let's go ahead and finish that, uh, make it a good experience for everyone. Um, make sure that as a community that we're thinking about diversity and inclusion. I think that uh, inclusivity is part of accessibility. And uh, we need to uh, support and amplify voices in the community. Make sure that uh, regardless of background or contextual differences of people, that everyone's being accepted. When we build applications, we need to make them more accessible. Things like Hooks and React will help us to do this very easily. Um, I was also, that, also that screen reader announcement, uh, there's actually an alert component that I brought in. It's an accessibility component. And I just stick the message inside of it. So anytime that message changes, the screen reader reads it, right? So, that's another two lines of code, so I was wrong. 15 exactly lines of code. Um, again, all of my stuff, uh, resources for this talk are at this uh, address here. You can download the, uh, the GitHub re repo and everything else. And yeah, that's it. Thank you guys for hanging out. And if anyone has any questions or would like to go over a few things, we still have a few minutes. You can either come up here or ask questions. Yep, what's up? So most of the stuff that I showed you today was for um, managing state at an application level and at a component level. Um, so uh, in the case that you're talking about, Redex or MobX state tree are both things that you would use to do what you want to do, okay? So you're probably already doing it correctly. My, my, my point with all of this is that there are so many things inside of React that you don't need to use Redux for that you can use the uh, the the hooks right inside of uh, React to do those things for you. And you need to be making a clear separation between the actual uh, values that are inside of your React components and then the places where you're calling and kind of syncing up state outside of your application. Those need to be separated. So what this should allow you to do is if you've always used Redux to manage everything, you should be able to start pulling stuff out of there and using React for that, and only leaving the stuff in Redux or MobX state tree that is required for you to sync with your database or your API or whatever. Okay. That's what I would say. So you're probably already doing it right. Yeah, we still have a lot of that code because most of our code is interacting with the back end. So yep. Like yeah, absolutely. It also defines a clear straight line that you don't need to be crossing for either, right? Yep. What's up? Yeah. That was a very contrived example. I will say that out of the box. Just to be clear, you know, if you did actually have the unsubscribe for every name you ever call with, yeah. 
No, but uh, it does very simply illustrate that there's a way to clean up things inside of a use effect, and that's kind of what I was going for. But uh, I always have these contrived examples where someone always calls me out on them, and thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. I just wanted to be clear that, like, yeah, absolutely. You need to do cleanup, you know, well, I, and I think my, my, my main point here is that, like, I, what I wanted to show you guys is some of the different ways of using use effect, and, and like, just knowing, that, that's my time's up, but um, knowing that that's how you do it is by returning a statement with, with a function, like that's how you clean up. By passing a second argument, that is how you, uh, you know, do the other thing. So uh, th that's kind of what I was trying to show. Yeah. Yep. Example, Absolutely, and that's a good, that's a good point, that there's, there's more to it. Yep. So uh, Redux has all sorts of hooks that you can use. Uh, also MobX state tree. Any of the, any of the uh, uh, state management uh, libraries that you can pull in, they all now have their own uh, reducer or uh, hooks and everything that you can use to, uh, to hook into there, like, like with Thunk or Sagas or whatever, yeah. So and I, I, I'm, I'm a component developer. I don't get into a lot of the synchronizing uh, of the data. So some of the examples I've shown are very simple and just letting you know kind of, hey, this is where it is, this is when you need to explore that. But um, the last thing you probably want me doing on your team is kind of managing all that stuff. And I'll be honest about that. <laughs> well, I've heard business logic also, I think, uh, helps out with uh, any of these state management things. Like yeah. So uh, that's a concern, especially for really, really big applications. Yeah, so my, my, my thing is always, Start small, use what React gives you, and as you scale up, you're gonna find the places where you need to do something different, and only then do you switch to something else. That's, that's my advice. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm publishing on Monday, if you watch my Twitter, uh, I'm publishing a, 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 a document, like, like a blog, that has a bunch of the, like Kent C. Dodds, uh, the, the girl that was in here e earlier, Eve Porcello, all of these people who just give some basic advice of if you're getting started in React or if you're getting started with, um, uh, you know, what kind of advice can I give you? And all of them in 100 words or less kind of just give some basic advice. And there's a lot of advice like that in there, which is pretty cool. And it's like all these people from the community, and it's just the, you can read through the whole thing and get all this great advice on kind of, uh, you know, how to make yourself more performant in React, um, things that you should be doing differently, how you should kind of scale up and, and all these things. Everyone has a d different perspective on this stuff, so... Uh, that'd be, if you guys want to watch out for that, it'll be up on Monday. Uh, no, this is just a link to all the resources, but if you, uh, if you do go and follow me on, on uh, Twitter, at uh, HTTP Junkie right here, then uh, you'll, see, you'll see on Monday. I'll, I'll, I'll send that out. All right. No more questions? We're good? All right. Thank you, everybody. I am leaving. I got I to catch a plane to Bulgaria. <laughs>